Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to part two of this little series of videos on attacks on opposite wings, my top 10 middle game idea number five. Before I get started in this video, I wanted to uh, follow up on something I meant to mention in the previous one. So the last video um, we were attacking on opposite wings and uh, both sides had castled to opposite wings. And in most of the games we saw the uh, attack begin with a pawn storm. But in the final game in that video, um, we had uh, Velomirovich with the black pieces, and he was attacking on the uh, on the queen side here, where white had castled, and he kept his pawns back. So he had a, a different idea for the attack. He lined up his rooks on the c file, and he sacrificed the exchange on c3 to open up lines. So although uh, most of the time on these opposite wing attacks, you see them starting off with the pawn storm, and we'll see the same kind of thing in this video as well. I just wanted to point that out, that there are examples where you can just attack with your pieces, and that can be a very effective way of playing as well. Um, you know, sometimes you can use an exchange sacrifice, sometimes a piece sacrifice to open up lines, and sometimes just moving your pieces over to that side of the board, um, you can just uh, make enough threats that you uh, break through and win that way. So just... Uh, Keep that idea in mind. Uh, in this video, we're going to be looking at positions where um, where the sides, well, and this is an example where they castle to the same side, but they're still attacking on opposite wings. And a very handy rule here, this is a King's Indian position. Um, a very handy rule here is that um, you look at the locked up structure in the center if there is a locked up structure in the center like this where the two pawns can't come forward, um, you look at how the pawns are organized and you see which way the pawn chains are pointing and that tells you which side you want to attack on. I learned this uh, so-called pointing rule from uh, Dan Heisman. He's done a lot of uh, instructional videos. If you don't know about him, uh, he's a great resource as well. Um, so the pointing rule is very handy. Another example of where it might come into play is uh, in a position like this. This comes from the uh, French defense, where uh, white started off with uh, e4, black played e6, white played d4, black played d5, and then white pushed the pawn forward, which can happen then or it can happen later. Sometimes pieces come out, but uh, eventually this usually happens in the French, and you get this pointing structure where, um, <clears throat> where the um, black is attacking on the queen side and white will be attacking on the king side. So the pointing rule turns out to be a pretty accurate uh, thing and, and handy to know. Um, I want to contrast one other thing about these uh, pawn structures before I get going. Uh, in this video, I'm only going to be looking at the king's Indian pawn structure. And in the next video, I'll, I'll take a look at this uh, French defense type of pawn structure. So in the king's Indian pawn structure, um, this pawn chain often extends all the way down to g3, and, and in fact, we'll see that happening in this very first uh, example game. It seems kind of extreme, but uh, but that, that happens quite a lot. But uh, <clears throat> in exchange, white has more space on the queen side, and so um, so white is uh, is doing quite well in these positions um, just with the counterattack over here on the queen side. In the French defense, if we imagine this pawn chain extending, it actually comes all the way down here to uh, g7 if we were to just uh, extend it that far. And um, so black really can't afford to let that happen. So black often will stop the pawn chain from growing right here. And that will give these kind of positions a different character. So um, anyway, that's a little preview of what's going to come up, of what I will be covering in part three. Let's get back to um, the King's Indian. So this first game... I wanted to show you was played in 1961 at the USSR Championship. With the white pieces, we have Leonid Shamkovich, and with the black pieces, we have uh, uh, Rashid Nezhmetinov. Nezhmetinov is was a great attacking player, and uh, although he's better known uh, these days for being the teacher of Tal, another uh, great attacking player, um, but he played a lot of interesting games in his own right, and he's uh, fun to look at. Um, Shamkovich starts off with d4. And uh, as advertised, we're going to get into a King's Indian defense. So after c4, Nezhmetinov plays g6. Then we get uh, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, 
uh, very typical. And then um, here's where uh, Nezhmedinov plays something a bit unusual. He castles here. I think castling is uh, kind of asking for trouble <laughs> because white could play e5. The more common move order is to play uh, d6 here first and then uh, and then castle in the next move. We actually transpose back into this. I just wanted to point that out. He castles here and uh, uh, Shamkovich doesn't doesn't challenge him with this e5 move. He just uh, continues de developing with knight f3 and now uh, Rezhmetinov plays d6 and we get back to a typical typical position. So uh, white goes with bishop e2. This is the classical variation of the king's Indian. Black continues the e5. White castles. Black plays knight c6. And this is now the uh, Mar del Plata variation of the king's Indian defense. And uh, we see that we've got this kind of well-defined structure at this point. White has taken a lot of space in the center. And uh, and white is black is setting up for a kingside attack with uh, the with the pawn expansion, so uh, white has three different ways to play at this point. They're they're kind of similar, but there there are little differences. <clears throat> One idea here is to play knight e1. With the idea of bringing this knight to uh, d3 and pushing the c pawn forward, sometimes without even the help of the b pawn. Another idea is to play uh, b4 immediately. That's known as the bayonet attack. And then the third way of the playing is uh, how uh, uh, Shamkovich played here. He just put the knight on d2, and he's going to play b4 in the next move. So it's kind of similar to the immediate b4, but gets the knight out of the way. Um, and here, well, since black has been given a chance, he could actually throw in the move a5 here to try and slow down the, uh, the pawn advance on the queen side. But he's not interested in that. He drops his knight back to e8. He's just going to go straight for the attack. And so that's what happens. Both sides start throwing their pawns forward. Um, white takes a moment to defend the center with this f3 move. And black pushes on with f4. So this pawn chain has grown by one. And uh, it's getting ever more threatening, creeping, creeping closer to the king. But uh, white has counterplay over here with the, the move c5. And in fact, if you put a position like this in the chess engine, it always prefers white. White just has more space overall. There's kind of less space on the king side than there is on the queen side in this position. So, um, um, but it's a bit hard to uh, know how seriously to take these uh, engine evaluations because sometimes they run into trouble with, uh, with the slow motion attack. Black's pieces kind of creep forward very slowly and unless they're uh, looking ahead far enough, they don't notice uh, that things fall apart on the king side. So, uh, uh, so you can well just just take your computer evaluations with a grain of salt. That's all I want to say. Um, uh, anyway, Nezhmetinov continues on with g5. We get knight c4. It's the typical idea with these uh, pawn pushes is you bring the pieces in behind the pawns, even leaving the tension here. He could have taken, I suppose, but uh, leave the tension here and just pile up the pressure. Um, Rook to f7. This is a nice move by uh, Nezhmetinov. Has uh, the idea of coming over to g7 or to h7 and attacking, but also it has the idea that it can defend along the seventh rank against uh, some of these queenside advances. Uh, and that's a key, often a key idea. We saw this uh, in the previous video as well. There were certain pieces that, that played an important role uh, acting both defensively and offensively. We'll see white has some pieces like that in this position as well. So let's uh, continue on. Uh, bishop to d2. Actually, this, this bishop is going to turn out to have a role like that. This, uh, there's two ideas with this bishop maneuver. One is to um, open up a square for the rook so the rook can have the c-file. But the other one is that the bishop is going to park itself on this f2 square where it will have that dual role. It will be attacking on the king queen side and defending on the king side from that square. So let's continue. Uh, Black brings his knight out behind the pawns. The same idea. Bishop, uh, not that one, not that bishop. The bishop drops back to e1, continuing this maneuver. Um, this bishop drops back to f8. Seems like both sides are moving their pieces backwards, but there's an important point to this one. It's also defending against the king side 
uh, against the uh, advances on the queen side, but it's getting out of the way of the rook, so the rook can slide over here and attack from g7 or h7. Um, now this bishop takes up its ideal square on f2, or as I said, it's defending on both sides, defending on this side and supporting the attack on this side. And h5, the attack just continues. Rook to c1, taking that square vacated by the dark squared bishop. And knight to f6, bring another knight up behind the pawns. So finally, uh, white takes. White's the first one to strike here. C takes. And there's just enough defense here. White has um, a queen and a bishop guarding that d pawn. And uh, so he's holding on to it for a moment, even with uh, knight to b5. There's two knights attacking, but there's two pieces defending. So it's uh, safe for the moment, and black continues with g4. Um, one thing that's not safe, however, is the a pawn. The a pawn has just been sacrificed here, and um, and knight takes a7 was played. At this point, this is the first point in the game where uh, the chess engine starts to wonder if uh, if white is really okay, uh, and it starts to give black some chances. Um, the, the chess engine prefers bishop takes, but there are problems with this as well. You don't really want to move this bishop away. And uh, and so I'm not really sure. The attack may have continued very similar to how it happened in the game. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to give you that information for what it's worth. Um, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to take here. Maybe it's tempting to try and reduce the number of pawns coming forward. But, uh, well, there's another pawn ready to take its place. And you've opened up the h-file. So this actually... Uh, is a position that's pretty strong for uh, for black. So, so you want to avoid these kind of weakening moves in front of your king uh, as long as you can anyway. And we'll see that sometimes black has ways of forcing these things. So anyway, knight takes a7. You know, white is planning to suffer here on the king side, but hold the defense and just uh, win on the queen side. Um, now this bishop is under attack. And we'll see, this is actually kind of a key piece uh, in attacking over here on the king side. So uh, Nezhmet Dinov preserves it with bishop to d4. a4, just the inevitable uh, pawn storm keeps marching forward, and g3. <laughs> so once again, we have uh, this pawn chain extended by another link there. Uh, and um, the bishop uh, is, is uh, busy right now defending the knight. So the bishop needs to move away. It can't, uh, for example, you can't take twice on g3. Uh, pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop takes would lose the knight here. So he moves the bishop out. Of course, he can do this with tempo. So he moves the bishop to uh, b6, hitting the queen. The queen uh, moves away. But um, but one thing that's happened here is there's one less defender around the king side. So the king goes to h1 just to prepare... Uh, a space for maybe a rook to come over, and over if the uh, g-file opens up. Um, and Nezhmet Dinov continues with rook h7, putting the rook opposite the, ki the king. And now this knight uh, hops back to b5, um, going back to uh, pressuring the, uh, the d-pawn here, which actually is uh, inadequately defended at this point. There's just not enough defense for it because the, the queen is in the way of the bishop. So so he could just take that pawn right now. But um, but Nezhmet Dina finds a nice move here. Uh, if you want to, this this could be kind of a, a, a good position to look for a clever move. So you can pause the video and think about it. Uh, it's not the kind of move I would easily find, but maybe if you're a, a good attacking player, uh, you might be able to come up with this one. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. Um, you want your pieces to keep moving forward at this point, and uh, knight to g4 is the move. And uh, of course, the reason why it's hard to find is it looks at first as though uh, it could just be taken, but in fact, this loses. <laughs> if you take the knight, you know, then come back with the h pawn. You've opened up the h file. There's immediate threat here, and. Uh, this, this is all just winning for black. I'll give one line, which is not uh, necessarily best play, but it's kind of cute. So say h3 to defend. Um, pawn takes, pawn takes, rook, rook takes. Rook goes there anyway. K 
king up to g2, uh, rook to h2 check, king forward to f3, and knight to uh, h4 is mate. <laughs> so the lack of space over here on the king side has really come back to uh, haunt white. And notice these pawns from that massive pawn chain are blocking those two squares that the king might escape to. So in any case, it's uh, like I said, that wasn't best play, but uh, it is a uh, it is actually a winning attack for black in, in different ways. If uh, if that pawn gets taken, it's just too dangerous to let that file get opened and to have these uh, massive pawns coming forward. So. Um, in this position, uh, Shamkovich played the right move. Let's see, knight g4 was played. He just went h3, kicking the knight. So if the uh, if you can't take with the uh, g pawn, maybe you can take with the h pawn. Yeah, that's a little bit questionable too. But uh, but uh, white puts a stop. I mean, black puts a stop to it immediately with uh, queen to h4, pinning that pawn. So now once again, if the f pawn takes, you can take back with the h pawn, and you have this. Uh, you're breaking through on the uh, on the H file here, so the queen comes over to uh, or the queen lifts up to D2, maybe planning to defend along the second rank there. After queen D2, Nezhmetinov went uh, knight E3, finally getting that knight out of trouble. Also looking at the uh, G2 pawn, and uh, Shamkovich continued with his idea of defending on the second rank by moving his uh, bishop out of the way. You know, I, I think uh, White could have considered uh, taking this knight off with the uh, with the bishop, but actually that would not have helped. So the, uh, the attack is really reaching a critical stage here. And uh, see if you can find the best move for Black in this position. Okay, um, pause the video here if you want some time to think about it. I think uh, you should be able to find this one. It's a pretty uh, typical attacking idea, although maybe. Um, Searching for the follow-up is a good idea as well. Anyway, I'm going to give the answer away now. Uh, Nezhmetinov continued with uh, bishop takes h3. So that's why this light-squared bishop is such a key piece in these attacks, is it uh, can always be sacrificed here to open up the uh, lines around the king. So g takes h3. And now you might have thought the follow-up was queen takes. And maybe that's good. I actually didn't look at that. But uh, Nezhmetinov played uh, g2 check as perhaps even more incisive. Um, after the king moves, he gets a whole rook here. And, um, <clears throat> and so he started off by sacrificing a piece, but he gained the rook. So now he's in the situation where he's uh, continuing to attack, but he's also up the exchange. So pretty simple win from here. Uh, queen to g3 check. Um, Shamkovich blocked with the bishop. And then he just brings another piece in with knight to h4. And uh, well, there's no saving this pinned piece. Uh, Shamkovich, you know, maybe they're short on time and just blitzing, blitzing out these last moves because it uh, could easily have resigned. <laughs> but he played queen f2. So knight takes bishop, uh, queen takes queen, pawn takes queen. And here he resigned. Here he's, uh, since uh, black has gathered a bishop, um, black is just an entire rook up. And, uh, and the attack is momentarily uh, slowed down. There's, he's not going to get mated over here, but uh, he has nothing big on the queen side that will compensate for being down a rook. So that's how the game ended. I wanted to take a look at the same kind of position from the uh, white point of view next. So I chose a game. This was played in 1997 between Victor Korchnoi with the white pieces and Luke Van Whaley with the black pieces. Luke Van Whaley is a strong Dutch grandmaster, and Victor Korchnoi was a several times candidate for world champion, although he never quite made it to the top. In 1997, he was a little past his peak, but he was still quite a strong player. And um, he also had a great reputation as a King's Indian killer. So um, Luke, on the other hand, was a very aggressive player, and he wasn't afraid to challenge Victor uh, with the King's Indian defense. So we get a very uh, interesting struggle here. So Korchnoi starts off with c4. Um, Van Whaley goes knight f6. Then he goes, Korchnoi goes d4. And we get the same position. The other in the previous games, d4 first and then c4. And let's just go through the moves. It's, um, well, I just wanted to show this once from white side as well as black side. These are all standard moves played in the normal order here. Uh, black playing d6 first before castling. Uh, Korchnoi did something a little unusual. Normally knight f3 
is played first. He goes with bishop e2 first. But we get the same position. This is the uh, classical king's Indian. Classical setup against the king's Indian defense. Black goes with e5 and uh, white castles. Black plays knight c6 to force something in the center. And uh, black, uh, white, white pushes on with d5. The knight drops back to e7. And this is the uh, Mar del Plata variation, uh, perhaps the most common variation of the king's Indian defense. So now Korchnoi plays the move knight e1. I think this was one of his specialties. In the previous game, knight to uh, d2 was played. And uh, also b4 can be played here, the bayonet attack. But uh, knight e1, we will see. I mentioned in the previous video some of the ideas, but we will see them played out in this game. Um, uh, Van Wele drops his knight back to e8. He wants to be able to push his f-pawn forward as well. Uh, sometimes that knight goes to d7 instead of e8. I think actually that's, that's more common. But uh, this is okay as well. Um, now bishop to e3, f5. And uh, well, I wanted to make a note of this bishop e3 move. Well, let's play on. A uh, couple more moves. So f5 provokes uh, f3, and now f4 kicks the bishop, and the bishop drops back. So notice that in this game, the bishop went to e3 and then to f2 in two moves. In the previous game, the bishop took this kind of uh, snake-like path around to the f2 square. And so you can think that, uh, you might think that uh, white had lost some tempo, uh, a few tempos uh, getting the bishop over there. So it seems like this move order by Korchnoi is, is pretty clever. And notice it had to be played <clears throat> right here. Bishop e3 has to be played right here. If you have, um, if you have the move knight to d3 instead, then this uh, pawn push will come too fast. You'll have to play f3. The pawn will then move forward to f4, and the bishop won't be able to use the e3 square. So if you're going to do this maneuver, this is this is the right time to do it. Put the bishop on e3 right now before f5 is played. And then after f5, you continue with f3, kicking the bishop and dropping back to f2. So black continues his attack with the g5, and Korchnoi pushes on with c5. So everything that white is doing here seems geared towards uh, getting the action going on the queen side as fast as possible. The idea of getting the bishop over here and two moves instead of four, and the idea of pushing the c-pawn forward without uh, bothering with the, uh, the b-pawn to support it. And this is, uh, this pawn push is supported by the knight, and uh, I mean supported by the bishop, and the knight will follow up with knight to d3. But um, uh, Luke van Vele isn't bothered. He continues with his normal setup, knight to g6. I think um, h5 is a little more common right in this position, but uh, well, h5 is going to happen uh, eventually anyway, so uh, that's, it's just kind of a matter of the order in which these moves are played. Uh, and then uh, uh, Korchnoi keeps the tension here. He's got this well defended. He's not at all worried that, um, that uh, black will take here. He's got a piece ready to take back, and this pawn might become a menace coming forward. So black isn't inclined to take. And, uh, and Korchnoi can just maintain the tension there. So he just pushes his A pawn. He's going to bring another piece, uh, another pawn forward to soften up the queen side. This rick goes to f7. We saw this maneuver in the previous game. Now knight to d3, also supporting, um, not only supporting c5, but also looking at the uh, b4 square, as we will see. And then the bishop here drops back to f8, getting out of the way of the rook and uh, defending over here, defending the center. This maneuver, too, is something we saw in the previous game. Uh, Korchnoi is not phased. He just uh, continues on the queen side, pushing the a pawn. Uh, Van Wely swings the rook over to the g file opposite the king, and the pawn goes all the way to a6. So at this point, um, Van Wely decides to take the pawn. I think um, he probably was not happy about allowing this exchange and dragging, dragging the bishop away from... Uh, from this good diagonal where it may sacrifice itself on h3. So um, taking seemed like a good solution. Um, b6 maybe was possible. I think this would have uh, kind of ended up like the game after this exchange. Um, this knight would still hop into b4 and, and be looking at uh, coming into c6, harassing the queen as happened in the game. Anyway, let's let's go back to the game. Van Wely took. Of I played knight b4 immediately. Um, Knight to f6 was played by uh, Van Wely here, bringing his, his knight over. 
and now this knight does hop into c6 as advertised and well it's interesting there's only two squares for the queen e8 and d7 the chess engine rates those two moves queen e8 and queen d7 is about the same and uh, von Whaley chose queen d7 um, but it seems there's a slight tactical problem with that so if you want to uh, see if you can spot a clever move for white in this position uh, pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away now. The move that Korch and I played here was knight takes a7. And that's that's the clever move I was thinking to, referring to. Um, it can't be taken because pawn to c6 is a double attack. It uh, attacks the rook and it also attacks the queen. So, um, so that uh, knight is safe there. And not only that, uh, it's hitting the bishop, which... Uh, as I was mentioning, is, is a good piece that it wants to participate in the attack over here on the king side. But there's no way to save it at this point. You, uh, Black cannot prevent that bishop from being traded off. Uh, it has no moves other than, um, other than b7, and then it will run into the fork. So that would lose material as well. So Van Whaley just uh, takes. He grabs a pawn so that he stays a pawn up, and uh, Korchnoi grabs the bishop and then uh, brings his rook to c1. So uh, you can say that this is a uh, mission accomplished, as it were, for uh, White's queenside attack, or at least the, the first phase. Um, what he's done is he's created these weaknesses. It is true that uh, Black is a pawn up, but um, those, those pawns are going to get whittled away one by one. And, um, and the second uh, part of his mission was he got rid of this strong attacking piece. So. So this uh, attack on the queen side, this expansion on the queen side, is already starting to pay dividends. Uh, Von Wehle at this point just continues on the king side with uh, h5. Uh, the chess engine prefers the move bishop to d6 here, with kind of an interesting idea. Um, it's not really saving the c-pawn. The c-pawn um, is going to be lost just as in the game. Knight a4 was played in the game and would be played here. Um, uh, but the chess engine would like to push on the g-pawn immediately, push forward the g-pawn immediately, uh, keep this h-pawn, I guess, in reserve. Uh, and after knight takes pawn, this knight drops back to f8, opening up the h-file for the rook. And notice that uh, the square on f8 is where the uh, bishop was standing. So that was why uh, bishop d6 right at that moment was a useful move. It's more about uh, getting out of the way of the knight than it is about uh, defending the center, although maybe it, it also, I mean, it is also defending the center, so maybe it has a, a role there as well. But it's interesting that the two moves for the bishop, you know, from here to here and from here to here, um, you know, they were a bit about defending the center, but also about getting out of the way of the other pieces. Anyway, Van Whaley didn't uh, play that way. He just continued with the attack, h5, and now knight to a4, as I said, uh, uh, Korchnoi is going to round up that pawn, g4. Knight takes c5, and um, Van Whaley just keeps pushing. He pushes right on with g3. So we get this entire uh, big pawn chain, as we saw in the previous game. But there is um, one or two differences. Uh, the, the base of the pawn chain has disappeared, and then this pawn is actually not going to stay there for too long. Um, now, white doesn't want to take right away and open things up. The, the bishop would be loose here on g3. And uh, and also, um, you know, it open open up that line for the the uh, rook. Although that's going to get opened up anyway. But uh, Korchnoi wants to make uh, Black work a little bit, I guess, to open things up. He drops the bishop back to e1. Uh, Van Whaley takes, and then Korchnoi takes back with the king. I think this is really interesting. He's not uh, he's not uh, interested in just hiding underneath the pawn, cowering with the king over here on h1. It's also possible that uh, with the king on h1, the pawn on g2 will become difficult to defend. For example, the rook can't go to, to g1 to defend it. But whatever, he, he decided to take that pawn, and uh, his judgment turned out to be correct. It just seems that uh, black's pieces are a little bit discoordinated by the previous trade. Um, you know, it pulled the queen to the uh, this light square diagonal where it can't easily get back into the game and and white has just enough time to organize a defense here uh, while black is rearranging his pieces to uh, to renew the attack so a nice bit of calculation from Korchnoi I think um, black continues with uh, bishop takes c5 
or take c5, knight to e8. And this knight to e8 is part of that rearrangement. That knight was sitting here blocking the dark squared diagonal. The queen can't come in on the light squared diagonal, so it has to take this route into the game, so the knight has to get out of the way. But that gives uh, Korchnoi time to bring his rook over, rook to h1, queen to d8, and now the king just tucks itself back on g1. The queen comes out to g5, and now there's some potential threats. Um, you know, a move like knight to uh, a move like knight to h4 would threaten mate on g2, for example. So, but uh, it's Korchnoi's move, and he plays rook to h2, and that uh, seems to take care of that threat. So uh, Benueli plays rook to b8, taking a look at this loose pawn. Korchnoi pushes it forward to where it's defended, and the rook lifts up to b6. So maybe trying to bring this rook over to the, the king side with a tempo. But uh, Korchnoi plays rook a5, and uh, well, I find this very remarkable. Uh, so Benueli pushes on with h4, and Korchnoi just grabs that pawn. That's, that's what I find remarkable. He's just decided that uh, this attack is not going anywhere, and uh, he can afford to grab another pawn on the queen side and start realizing his uh, advantage over there. So if, um, if black were to play something like h3, yeah, it just turns out this doesn't go anywhere. There's a couple of defensive moves that white has. For example, the rook could come back to a2 to defend that way. The bishop could drop back to, uh, to f1. But even in this case, there's there's even a better move, which is the bishop can come forward to c8 and uh, and just take that pawn off before uh, before black has time to unmask the attack along the uh, g file. So everything is just uh, clicking for white here, and that uh, pawn push is not working in this position. So um, Van Wely tried the move knight to d6. This introduces some other ideas. Actually, it's often the case that a knight on d6 or uh, sometimes f6 can sacrifice itself against the pawn chain here. This would uh, allow these pawns to come forward, maybe open up some lines or some squares for black p black's pieces to take advantage of. So, so these sacrifices always have to be uh, calculated in positions like that. But it seems like um, there's nothing great that can be done here. Uh, Korchnoi just drops his bishop back to defend extra defender for the g2 square, making sure that h3 is never really a threat. Um, the rook drops back to b8. I mean, that was the other thing bishop to f1 did, is it opened up the uh, a file for the rook to come down and deliver a check. So this rook drops back, it blocks the check, and maybe the rook can get in along the first rank now that, uh, well, this knight came out and blocked, blocked the sixth rank there. And now after uh, queen c2, you can kind of feel that the tide has turned in the game. Uh, Black has been pushing forward all this time, step by step, occasionally making little defensive moves, but, but pretty much keeping a steady progress on the king side. But he kind of runs out of things to do over here at this point and has to turn his attention back to defending on the queen side with uh, queen to e7. Uh, Korchnoi's queen comes into c6. Let's see, rook h7 was played. Maybe, maybe still hoping to get that h pawn going. Uh, rick to a7 was played, setting up uh, potential pins along the uh, seventh rank here. Uh, the queen gets out of the way by going to d8, and now the b-pawn just uh, rolls on with uh, b5. So rick to b6, blocking the b-pawn and uh, harassing the queen. But, uh, well, one thing I've noticed over the years by watching uh, strong players' games, looking at games from strong players, is they often find ways to avoid doing what their opponent wants them to do. So this rook is asking the queen to please uh, vacate the premises, and uh, Korchnoi wants to keep it there. So he uh, plays rook to a8 instead of moving the queen. And now Van Whaley doesn't want to trade queens, so he uh, drops the rook back to avoid the queen trade. But, uh, well, that lets Korchnoi trade off a pair of rooks, and he's happy to do that with less force. It becomes easier to defend the king. And now he uh, proceeds with bishop to f2, putting it back on this good diagonal and uh, preparing to push that pawn forward. At this point, uh, Van Whaley goes into full defensive mode and decides he needs to bring the king over to help defend the queen side. He goes king f8. We have rook h1. Maybe the rook will also come over to the queen side, but it's no longer needed to defend uh, g2 in any case. Uh, the king goes to e7. Um, this bishop goes to c5, pinning the knight. 
um, the other night goes to f8. Maybe it'll find some uh, useful useful squares to go to over here on the queen side. Bishop comes out to d3. I'm not sure if there was a sacrificial idea at that point, but in any case, this uh, defends nicely against anything that knight might want to do. And then uh, rick to h6, so setting up maybe a potential threat against the knight. If, uh, if uh, white were to be so incautious as to play king f2, the knight could uh, move with check. But of course, Korchnoi is not going to do that. In fact, he plays uh, bishop back to f2, making sure the king doesn't go there. Uh, let's see. So the knight comes into g6, so rearranging the knight that way. The king steps up to h2, allowing this rook to come into the game. This king goes over to d8, holding onto the c-pawn. Now the b-pawn comes forward. Uh, this knight goes to e7, so it made a little roundabout journey, but it finally got to a square. It can chase the queen away, but the queen just drops back to c3. And at this point, Van Whaley finally decides he's had enough, and he resigns. Um, there's just a lot of pieces under fire here. This pawn he is under fire from the uh, bishop, and after the king steps back, the rook will be hitting it. The queen is hitting the loose pawn on e5, and then this pawn is under fire as well. On top of that, uh, white is a pawn up and has the bishop pair. So just a winning position for white, and Van Whaley decided he had had enough. So anyway, it's uh, games like this that it uh, caused the King's Indian defense to kind of decline at popularity at the top level. Um, you know, in the first place, there's loads of theory that the top guys have to memorize to just uh, survive the opening. And then uh, if, uh, if white can find enough resources to hold off this uh, kingside attack, then white is just winning on the queen side. And it seems like, uh, you know, as they've studied this position more and more, uh, that white does have sufficient resource to hold hold off against that attack. So, um, but there are still exceptions. It still gets played from time to time, and I have uh, one more game I want to show you in this uh, position. But that game is a little too long to fit into uh, this video, so I guess you will just have to wait until the next episode of Top 10 Middle Game Ideas. So I'll see you then. Bye.